Chris says, are the Hebrews lights the same as the Hebrew Roots movement? The answer is no, they're not the same. They definitely have some similarities. But, you know, whereas I specialize in Hebrew Israelites, you got my man R.L. Solberg, who specializes in Hebrew Roots. My man Jeff Cran, before he passed away, rest in power, my brother, he specialized in that as well. He did his Talbot uh, doctoral project on issues related to Hebrew roots. And so actually, I encourage you to check out Neeson Cran. He still has good material online. Check out some of his stuff and his programs that he did because he dealt with some with that. R.L. Solberg calls it Torahism. He doesn't really call it Hebrew roots movement. And I like that. Just like he calls it Torahism, of course, I call the guys I deal with Hebrew Israelism. And so that is what that is. And then uh, Ant says, do they have a point with the biblical expectation to sin, to not sin after believing? No, they do not. So, you know, that's a doctrine sometimes called perfectionism, or uh, sometimes people will call it um, something, they might say something like uh, total sanctification. And there's a debate about, you know, if that's going too far, does that equal a heresy? The idea that, that you could be sinless. Usually people maybe who might be from a Wesleyan mindset might um, fall into it. Sometimes that's what you'll see, you know. Uh, usually you don't have people falling into it who are from the reform perspective. And uh, I think that's a good thing that they don't follow fall, fall into that because perfectionism is problematic. Let's take a look real quick here at uh, a dictionary definition for it. Now, if you mean do they have a point, do they have a point that we should recognize the lordship of Christ in our life and that we should, uh, you know, strive to please God and that we should work hard as we can and that we should love righteousness? If you mean do they have a point by that, well, yeah, they have a point by that. But if you mean, you know, something else, then the answer is no. Let me see here if I can bring it up on the screen. Okay, that's not going to work here. Let me, uh, just a second here, I'm going to try to switch over. I have a little entry from one of my Bible dictionaries on Logos that I'd like to use. By the way, don't forget that there is a code, and it's in the description box every show. And if you use that code, uh, the link that I provide, and the name, you can actually, uh, <clears throat> it's pretty cool get a discount on buying Lagos and get like five books free. And what it does, it helps me because I it, it goes directly to me getting credit and to being able to uh, have credit to get more um, uh, uh, resources. That's what, that's what I do with it. So it, it's a beneficial thing. Let me take these off. These are from a prior program here and then put this over here. This is from the New Dictionary of Theology. Historical and systematic. Let's look up the entry uh, on this. And while I'm doing that, listen, if you don't know what this show today is, I'll tell you. This is called The Smoke Room, and it's a program where you can bring your questions, your comments, your concerns. And I do what I can with answering and looking into them. And so that is what the show is of today. So I encourage you to tell people to come on in. Well, we had to start this quite early, so some people may not know actually that we are live. They may not even be aware, and uh, that's that's my fault. But you know, sometimes with these things, you gotta you gotta get them in there when you can. And sometimes uh, schedules change and things like that. That's what I had today. So first, I'm gonna take a look at, at this, um, and and then we'll, we'll we'll learn more about it together. Perfect teleos and perfection teleosis are New Testament terms found in the sayings of Jesus, Matthew 5, 48, 19, 21, teaching of Paul, Philippians 3, 12 through 15, the epistle to the Hebrews, 6, 1, and the Johannine literature, 1 John 4, 12, 17. Throughout Christian history, attempts have been made to understand what such passages imply. And some of the early apologists, such as Aristide, uh, Aristide, how is that trouble? Aristides, Ath Athenagoras, and Justin, this was interpreted as an absolute sinlessness. And some of the writings of the so called apostolic father, example given the shepherd of Hermas. So, what they're making the point is 
there were some Christians who fell into this pretty early, and we can see that in some writings. So we can't deny that it's there, and there are some examples given. Now, that doesn't mean it's right because it's early, okay? The question is, is it biblical? Wrestle with the question of whether sins committed after baptism could be forgiven. So there was definitely some mistakes before things were systematically worked out in some people's understanding, just like today, of course. And some people had this idea that you would be baptized and it would wipe out all your sins prior to that. But then there was question about what about sins committed after baptism? And because of this uh, belief that honestly is a little strange and, and not accurate, some people would get to where they would say, okay, look, we, um, we have to be really careful. We have to be really careful now with what we do afterwards uh, in relationship to to uh, you know our, our walk with the Lord, because we haven't we we, we can't get we're not going to get baptized again. So let's let's get our baptized as late as we can in life. And sometimes people speculate that that might be why at the end of his life, if you know anything about Constantine, it wasn't until the end of his life that Constantine was baptized. And some people say uh, they have different reasons for that. We don't know all the reasons exactly why he did that. But a lot of it may have to do with that idea that, hey, you got to wipe these sins away with a baptism, of course. And again, it's a mistaken idea. But I'm just putting some more context here. We're again reading from the uh, NDT on this question of perfectionism, since that was the first question that was asked in the smoke room. And I do let people uh, do questions in the live chat. And you could come on. It doesn't have to only be smoke, you know what I mean? It can be any kind of question. Uh, it can also be just general questions or concerns or comments, you know, anything. Okay, continue on here. So, by the way, make sure you like this. Make sure you share this and make sure that you please comment. All right, here we go. Continuing on here. Some balance appear, however. In the teaching of Clement of Alexandria, that's North Africa, of course, who stated that while Christians were in one sense perfect, once they were baptized into Christ, and they give the source there, see that? That's Clement's writings. And their lives evidence a transformation. They still had to grow to a more mature level of perfection. And they give the source again for Clement's writing. Clement wisely defined this Christian maturity positively rather than negatively, that is, not as sinlessness, but as a growing knowledge and love of God, which purifies the heart. So we're kind of working through the doctrine throughout Christian history is what the, what this is doing right now. And that's, that's, this is why it's a historical dictionary we're looking at too, as well. It's not, it's a biblically historical one that goes through church history as well. The, this idea of a relative perfection um, a maturity which ended the instability of the divided heart characterized the spirituality of the Eastern Fathers. Through the example of Anthony challenges a young man by Matthew 19, 21, and here's what that says. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. And most people have understood this idea perfect, not to be sinless here, but teleos in the sense of being complete or whole. And that usage of that Greek word teleos is evidenced outside of the Bible. And so it doesn't have to be um, only perfected in the sense of you're sinless there. And uh, so that should enter into the discussion uh, as far as on a semantic level and a lexical level where we have this discussion as far as what Jesus is saying. This inward perfection or purity of heart became the goal of the monastic movement. So that has to do with asceticism and that's somewhat synonymous with monasticism. And that is where you have this training or exercise or practice of spiritual disciplines that are designed to uh, encourage interior vigilance, as the definition says, so as to combat vices, and develop virtues by means of self-discipline and self-knowledge in the context of seeking God. So usually it involves drawing away from the larger world as well. Its chief preoccupation is the desire to master the lower nature and gain freedom from the disordered passions through renunciation of the world and the flesh as part of the great struggle against the devil. So that's what that is. So it's saying that 
this inward perfection or purity of heart became the goal of monastic movement. And they give some examples. Pursued in different ways by Pachymus, Basil, Cassian, and Benedict, probably the most famous of all, would be Benedict in his whole tradition. And you see when that came about, 480 to 550. Although, of course, there was ascetics and monastics prior to that. Given his strong development of the doctrine of original sin, it is not surprising that Augustine was pessimistic about the possibility of even a relative perfection in this life. And then they give a book by Augustine you can read on man's perfection in righteousness. Now, I've read some Augustine, or read some Benedict for that matter. I have not read this book by Augustine, but I'd be curious, and my bet would be, out of everything mentioned, besides the scripture itself, as far as the interpretation, most likely would be the place, the thing that I would agree with most, because I do believe that when you look at the early church, besides the scripture itself, again, obviously we're saying now here, Augustine would have the closest, the most healthy, the most biblical view about anthropology. So man's sin, man's relationship to his sin, man's holiness or lack thereof. And when I say men, I do mean men and women as well. And you know what? Let me make this a little bit bigger. I'm seeing that it could be a little bit bigger here on the screen for you. It looks fine for me, but I just did a check, and I feel like you guys could benefit from me making the text a little bit bigger. So there, I did two increases. That should work. So Augustine is like a breath of fresh air. I believe he's much more biblical, and I know I would more align with him, and I know my man Jesse would as well. So continuing on. Despite his pessimism, the ladder of perfection, the idea of a scale of degrees of perfection, characterized the spirituality of the medieval period. So the idea is that it's kind of like you're getting there, though. You're always going up in your sanctification. Now, I would say that's the ideal Christian life, you know. But I also think we can know practically that's not always how it goes for all of us, is it? You may see some books. For example, I know Wayne Grudem taught in Systematic Theology 501, I believe it was. He had that, and I agree with that, but I also know it doesn't always happen, and I don't believe that means the person's not a Christian or anything like that. But I know that um, sometimes life kicks us in the butt, and we don't always respond the right way, do we? You know? But that's still that general idea. And, of course, the ladder of perfection I think that can just be said that you're going up. That's the goal that we aim towards still. So we don't give up. We're not antinomians here, okay? You know, Augustine probably in this context is writing against Pelagius and Pelagianism. Very problematic. Uh, keep on going here. Bernard of Clairvaux, On the Love of God is the work they're referencing, identified four degrees of love. Self-love, loving God for his benefits, loving God for his own sake, and loving oneself only for God's sake. The fourth degree was possibly only in the life to come, but Bernard regarded the third degree as a level of perfection possible in this life. Thomas Aquinas, smart guy, sometimes underrated, sometimes hated, sometimes loved too much, very controversial these days, similarly defined perfection in terms of love and taught that absolute perfection was possible for God alone. Even the perfection of loving God as much as we possibly can is impossible in this life. Uh, I wholeheartedly agree with that. But there is a lower level where everything contrary to the love of God, such as mortal sin, is removed. There can be no love of God without this, and so it is essential to salvation. It may also move a notch higher so that everything hindering the affections toward God is removed. And this is the highest perfection possible in this life, Summa Theologica, sources cited. So what we're looking at there, right there, by the way, it's summarizing Aquinas. So we're looking at different people's views in this throughout church history. That's, that's where we're going. Uh, that's what kind of dictionary this is. Looks like we're getting a lot more questions here. I'll get to those. Just hold on to those. I'll get to those, okay? I'm still answering this one. Once I got into this definition, I kind of like doing this discussion. The Reformers reacting against the hypocrisy of much 16th century monasticism generally rejected any idea of perfection as contrary to justification by grace through faith. Calvin's exposition of Christian sanctification, more positive than that of Luther, still remained extremely suspicious of it. In the 17th century, some pietists, that's a certain movement with certain emphasis, and let me just give you the 
quick definition of that. Um, <clears throat> and it's uh, sometimes it gets a bad rap, but I think their concern ultimately is of holiness and uh, really regulating that. And that's kind of what we got to do because we're so weak. Shout out to Phil Fox. Everyone definitely subscribe to him. He's been dropping some jewels lately. That's why brother been putting down him and BK Definitely want to check out his content. Does great work and is a great brother in the Lord indeed. Some pietists developed a more positive line, but this was defined as maturity, not sinlessness. John Wesley, and sometimes you'll hear people describe their position as Wesleyanism. It's sort of an alternative to describing it as Arminianism, although some people see a difference. And I think I generally would say, usually when people describe Wesleyanism, it's oftentimes a little bit better than Arminianism. Although if we're talking about the original Arminius, that would be even better yet. Shout out to Super Chat, my man, Jay Fry. Thank you very much, my friend. The first and only Super Chat of the day. You help keep me going. By the way, we need four, last time I checked it, maybe three now, four more people at patreon.com slash vocab to get us to 100. That's our consistent goal that we maintain. One zero zero. It's kind of what we need for a baseline to be able to do this. We got Berean Babes in the chat. Definitely subscribe to her work as well. It's someone else you definitely want to subscribe to. And shout out to the mods, D New and Mr. Phil Fox. What's up, y'all? <clears throat> Wesley similarly developed the idea of perfection as maturity, being deeply influenced by Clement of Alexandria and by homilies thought to have been written by Macarius the Egyptian. Now, notice this real quick. I want to show you something. By the way, the work they're referencing by John Wesley was a plain account of Christian perfection. Notice how people in the Reformation and after often were accused of deviating from all of church history by people associated with Rome. But notice how uh, there's a concern about what happened before, and that's because of a certain level of humility that you should get as you experience maturity because you realize lots of Christians have come before. They've thought and talked and wrote about a lot of this stuff, and we don't want to be way out there in la-la land. That's the uh, J. Fry Super Chat coming through. And so let's make sure we're not the only persons who have ever said this idea or came up with this idea. So notice how Wesley is reading Clement of Alexandria. He's reading Macarius the Egyptian. And notice also how he's looking at sources just outside of his context. Clement and Macarius are in different times, and they're both in Africa. Do you see that? This is how it should be, where the whole church, past and present, is working together as a body to develop its theology. And again, let me make this yet a little bit bigger. I'm still feeling like you guys could benefit from uh, this being a little bit larger as far as the font. I really want you guys to be able to see what I'm looking at here. Okay, so hopefully you're still following along with this question about perfectionism, or sometimes called entire sanctification. Continuing on, what does it say here? Um, <clears throat> like Bernard and Aquinas, he defined it as perfect love, that is, the fulfilling of the law as summarized in the Great Commandments. This was not attained by discipline, but was the gift of grace received in entire sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 Which was an act of God, yet never apart from the believer's self-discipline and patient seeking. He, it's Wesley, refused to define this perfection as sinless and ejected extreme perfectionists from his Methodist societies. Now it's important because usually the perfectionists' movement comes out of somebody who in some ways involved with some branch of Wesleyanism, whether they know it or not. And when he was alive himself, Wesley would not define what he was uh, shooting for, for lack of a better phrase, as sinless. And he kicked out people who were the extreme perfectionists from his Methodist societies. I think that's important. Yet he did believe that loving God with a pure heart necessarily implied a cleansing from sinful self-love. Wesley's doctrine, of course, was rejected by his Calvinist allies in the 18th century awakening. Now, notice, though, it's nice that he did have allies within that because Wesley did get along with some Calvinists, and some Calvinists got along with Wesley, but they didn't always agree, as you can tell. In the 19th century, Wesley's teaching partly inspired the holiness or higher life movement. Now, me, as a young man, I was raised 
primarily within churches that could be characterized as being part of the holiness movement. Uh, obviously not way back in the 19th century, but churches that if you looked at their pedigree of their teaching and things like that, it would be related to that. Similes of God, different types of Pentecostals or Charismatics, different types of Methodists, different types of Nazarenes, and some other smaller branches. That's what I was primarily around. So I was around people every now and then that did believe that, you know, perfectionism and taught that and and pushed that and and you would find books about it. It was kind of like something that was on the low and people try to try to push it every now and then. But most people know not to get too close to it, you know, because they saw the problems it created. So let's talk about this because this is church history right now. Wesley's teaching partly inspired the holiness or higher life movement, which lacked the sophistication and balance of his thought and was strongly criticized by B.B. Warfield of Princeton, known as the Lion of Princeton. Wrote a lot on inerrancy, some great stuff that still stands the test of time. I was actually looking at one of his books on Jesus last week, The Lord of Glory. That's, that's the name of the book. Within American Methodism, this was propagated by a doctor's wife, Mrs. Phoebe Palmer, whose altar theology, now this is what a lot of Americans have an experience with, you know, an emphasis on consecration constituted what she regarded as a shorter way to entire sanctification. Across the denominations, the holiness movement was also influenced by the teaching of Charles Finney. And as a Calvinist, whenever I say his name, I have to go, boo, boo. Although he did some good stuff in regards to abolition and that. So I love him on that, but I don't love him on the other stuff. So in regards to the abolition stuff and all that, I gotta say, yay. He, he was ahead of his time in a lot of ways, but some of his theology makes me want to say, boo. The American Revivalist. That the baptism of the Spirit, which the disciples received as a second blessing, and I grew up around this, but I do not agree with it, on the day of Pentecost brought them to perfection. This had a strong influence on William and Catherine Booth of the Salvation Army. William Booth, amazing man, but that stuff's not good. That doesn't mean the Salvation Army is bad per se. Um, my family actually has a lot of ties in the Salvation Army and um, a great, wonderful organization. But you got to know some of this underlying theology. And our Robert and Hannah Purcell Smith, whose teaching led to the Keswick movement. I don't know as much about that, by the way. But there the influence of Finney was barely detectable. Leading speakers at the annual Keswick Convention, including Anglicans such as Bishop H.C.G. Moore, Presbyterians, yay, <laughs> such as Andrew Murray, and he has a good book on sanctification, I believe, and Baptists such as Graham Scroge. In the early 20th century, the Keswick movement came to dominate evangelical Christianity in the English-speaking world and modern missionary movement, but it is doubtful if it is rightly described as perfectionist. Unlike the patristic and medieval tradition, and unlike Wesley, its focus was not so much on a positive perfection understood as mature, wholehearted, undivided love for God and neighbor, as on the negative aspect of victory over sin through a decisive act of faith, faith and consecration. Finney's doctrine of the baptism of the Spirit, which again, I grew up around that for sure, was also to lead eventually to the development of Pentecostalism, but the idea of relative perfection as perfect love was largely lost in this movement too interesting so just some historical perspective there shout out to everybody who's coming through i see we've missed some questions so let me try to jump back over and see what questions we've got here and remember you can come in and be a guest if you would like to all right kaya meyer says i love you okay thank you it's so easy for us to be critical of other believers. I used to judge you a lot. I'm very sorry. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you for uh, coming around. What brought about the change? I'd like to know. Perhaps you've been perfected. Yes, Vocab. You believe in speaking tongues? It's the only direct evidence of being filled with the Spirit. Yeah, I know. AG, one of the uh, 16 fundamental truths, says... The initial physical evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in tongues. Deji does not teach, as some of you got, that you're not saved if you don't speak in tongues, but you haven't been baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit. But, you know, there's some moderating positions that have happened since then. Has anyone read about what Calvin said about Luther after he died? I have not. What, what was said? 
let us know because I don't know the answer to that question. I do not know the answer to that question. So if you have seen it, let us let us know. Andrew says, First John 1 8 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Thank you, Andrew. I agree, and I think that is a powerful uh, antidote against the problematic view of entire sanctification or perfectionism that I do not believe is accurate or biblical. So we agree with that, and that's a that's a good one. King Jacob says, "What type of questions can we ask today? Ask whatever kind of theologically qu- related questions you want to, uh, King Jacob. Come on in. Why don't you come on in? Someone click that link. Come on in." Walsh says, I can't bring smoke to vocab. We're both Calvinists. I deserve the smoke. Yeah, we all do, don't we? <laughs> I told you the Bible stance on that. We are not supposed to live in sin, but we still have to go through the sanctification process. Well, Chris, I hope all Christians would agree that we're not supposed to live in sin. Uh, but the challenge is, could we demonstrate that it is possible to be sinless this side of heaven? like the perfectionist folks state, and uh, the answer is no biblically, and even experientially, right? Lucho says, Evening, Malone. My question is this. Can a Christian be a Mason? I've spoken to people who claim to be Christians, but Masons at the same time. What's your say, bro? Well, look, there's people out there, Lucho, who know more about the Masons and whatnot than I do. And... um. I would say, you know, ask one of the specialists for some of the details. But as a kind of a general rule or general practice from what I've been able to discern, it's along these lines. Um, A person could be in one of these movements, but if they're going to be as consistent as they should be, when they look at the commitments that Masons ask them to make, there are going to be contradictions and inconsistencies between the commitments that Jesus Christ demands of them as disciples of his. So, if it's to be true, um, some of the oaths that even kind of benign, regular, chill Masons have to take seem problematic from what I've seen. They do seem very problematic. And I don't know how to Christian. I don't know how a Christian in good conscience could make some of those oaths or take part of some of those ceremonies. Meanwhile, saying I'm a disciple of Christ, uh, I I struggle with that. However, since I believe in salvation by grace through faith alone, no one sin or error or mistake kicks you out of the kingdom, and so it could be a problem of confusion ignorance, all kinds of other things. We all have inconsistencies, don't we, in our practice? That is problematic, but I can't see that I could ever say, well, I know, therefore, that person is not a Christian. Now, when Christians have asked me, should I join such and such group, whether it's a fraternity, and I'm tying some of these things in together a little bit here, or one of these lodges, I've always said no especially when I look into the particulars of the one that they'll bring to me, I've always said no. Now, uh, I can see some exceptions perhaps because here's the thing. I don't know every group and every lodge and everything that they say and do. And I think with a lot of people that are in these things, they're only seeing the outside of it and they're not really putting too much stock in the history or what else it's related to or anything like that. And some of these guys are just simply doing things like raising money for kids. Now, I think some of the conspiracy theories come in that are problematic, where people tie in anything under the name of Masonic rites with any given Mason, and then kind of dump that all on top of them. And I don't think that's fair or proper or judicious or charitable or correct. And so I don't dump everything that's ever been said by any Mason about this is what Mason masonry is or whatever whatever, and try to dump it on top of any person who says yeah i'm a christian yeah i'm a mason i don't think that's right um and if someone can show me otherwise okay i'll say okay but i think uh there's people who really they're just going too far with that and i i don't think that we should do that either however i don't think we should be ignorant and unaware 
of some of the history and some of the related issues of these groups. Now, it does become a little bit more complicated when you look at the black church and some of the groups, the Mason, Masonic groups, because almost all of the early leaders of the, a lot of the early black denominations, a lot of them were involved with Prince Hall Masonry. And it's a little more complicated sometimes than their European counterparts from what I've been able to see. And also I think we should be charitable with how we view people in history. So I'm talking about in 2023 and not everything is a general blanket statement. Now, some of this, um, I'm, uh, I don't know if people understand fully what I'm saying, and some people would disagree, but it, let me just say this. Let me just in this. It's funny you asked this, because I just did order a book on the Masons by Stephen uh, Tasukalis. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his name. I'm pretty sure it's a Greek name. I've heard him speak once at ETS, and he has a book on the Nation of Islam that I really like, and I saw his book on Masonry, and even though it's not a specialty, I said, let me grab that, because his book on NOI is really good, and I'd be curious to see what his book is uh, in regarding the Masons. And so that's all I'll say about that for now. There's more to have a conversation about that. But very fascinating question. Very fascinating question. Hey, shout out to Carm. We got another squad member in the house and someone else who has been down for a minute. And we appreciate the folks who are OGs in this game. <laughs> Great questions, though. My goodness. My goodness. And I think uh, Chris answered the question as well in regards to that. And uh, Aunt Staff back with um, uh, the uh, question earlier in regards to perfectionism. He says, what is the view of the Hebrew Israelites on sinless perfection? Well, they're not really in the historical conversation, so they use different terms than that. But it can be said that there are some of the groups who teach you can be sinless. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One is some of the background that they come out of. Two is that they're kind of on their own doing eisegesis and ex eisegetical work, you know, without any real tether or anchor. So they'll end up there in those kind of waters. A lot of it has to do with the lack of understanding of biblical anthropology, who they are, who God really is. And also uh, incomplete homardiology, har which is the doctrine of sin. And uh, theology proper, which is the doctrine of who God really is, his holiness, his otherness, his purity, his fire, his flame, you know? And so Sakari, for example, is probably the most prominent in promoting a Hebrew-Israelite version of sinless perfectionism. And they'll say really simplistic, facile things in these kind of discussions that are so problematic and not well thought out that even other Hebrew Israelites will criticize them. So somewhat famously, Tahar of GMS has said, no, we still sin, and has went against Sakari when he talks about this particular doctrine of sinless perfection, although I haven't heard him refer to it as that, and criticizing them and letting them know that they're wrong on that, and that'd be a time where we would agree with Tahar, although I think Tahar probably has an incorrect definition of really what sin is in the first place. But it's kind of all over the map. Now, those are the only two group, groups that I know off the top of my head, but I know that there's more who come up with something. Jimmy Berman says, smoke room comes early. Yeah, what's well, scheduled for late tonight, but I'll just tell you what it is partially. Um, I found out that uh, Institute for Creation Research is having a talk here in Phoenix, Arizona about the importance of Genesis. And you got to understand, as a younger man, one of the first things that really drove me into apologetics was the question of creation and evolution. Not a specialty in it because I did not go the science route, primarily because of uh, some of the weak weaknesses in math that I knew would be problematic as far as natural gifting and what would work out. And more of a, uh, yeah, systematic theology apologetics guy, but uh, somewhat of a creative and uh and try to tie that in with what I do. Maybe that's why I'm on YouTube. Anyways, my point is Institute for Creation Research is doing a talk here in the Phoenix area, and I'm going to be going to it. And I started doing the math on the time, and I'm going to be getting back late. I'm going to be tired. And I said, I should do it now before I go instead of when I come back. And so it just has to do with that. So it's actually another apologetics event. I'm going to hear a speaker on that, and I like ICR. Salt of the Earth says, how do you discern between sincere and Christ-loving Christian hip-hop, and insincere Christian hip-hop. Like, of course, not all contemporary Christian music is made by sincere followers of Christ. Ooh, great question. 
it's funny. Everybody wants to answer questions in the live chat. Nobody wants to come in the smoke room. I know what's going to happen. I'm going to be winding down. It's going to be time for me to go. And someone's going to go ding, 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 ding. I want to come in the actual room and talk to me face to face. But for now, you're not here. So, hey, whatever. Well, uh, salt of the earth, I think we can get some hints and learn some things. But ultimately, I don't think we should spend too much time trying to figure that all out. Because I am skeptical of humans' ability to read other humans' hearts. Now, I know that's not exactly what you're asking. But since I think that is kind of a lost project, I don't think we should spend too much time being like, well, this guy's sincere, this guy's not. Now, look, here, let me say this. Here's my thoughts on the matter. I think that you can have insincere people who actually make Christian hip-hop, and I'm just talking about Christian hip-hop because you asked about CHH. And hold on, let me look this up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apply a scripture to this, so that's why I'm uh, looking at this here real quick. Check this out. I think even if you have some people who are insincere, I actually still think that they could benefit the listening audience, even if they actually are insincere. So let's say you discern, you know, I think this person's somewhat insincere. Let's even say that you're right. I actually believe that's a biblical principle. They could still be a blessing to others, even through their insincerity because of the power of the gospel. Uh, let me read here Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 12. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. He's in, he's in jail. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Verse 15, he addresses this. Listen, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Because of this, I rejoice. That's a deep passage. Tells you about how our attitude should be. Tells you about what's most important. So what I think we see here is that in this passage, these folks Paul is talking about, they are preaching the gospel. Because I've had people say, well, then you shouldn't criticize Joel Olstein. Well, he's not preaching the gospel, really. That's kind of the, the thing, all right? Regardless of motives. Paul's talking about people who are actually, their message basically is right. That's what the indication seems to be, doesn't it? Because he's glad about their message. He's not glad about their motives. So he's glad about their message, not about the motives. So he literally says some of them are insincere. They're doing this out of competition, out of spite for me. They, they, their motives are not good, are they? No, you saw that. Philippians 1, 15, 18, all that, right? And yet Paul rejoices the gospel is being preached. So I... When I think about Christian hip-hop, I'm just focused on that. Your question relates to CHH, to what I have the most experience and knowledge in, versus other forms of CCM, as it were. I think that, yeah, you can know some hints here and there and see some things, and especially, actually, even when you meet people. You know, I've met a lot of my heroes in Christian hip-hop. I've met a lot of guys. And a lot of times I'm impressed, praise God. A lot of times you're not impressed, though. And, you know, we can all have bad days, so I try not to be too judgmental about that, right? I'd want a measure of grace in regards to first impressions with myself as well, don't you, you know? But I would just say I can't discern all the time. Now, like I said, you can get some hints. When someone's out there prancing around and it's clear it's just about themselves, it's not just that, well, it seems insincere. Maybe they're just really immature. Maybe they're ignorant. Maybe that's their background. Maybe that's what where they're at in their faith. Maybe they're newbies. Maybe that's all they know. Maybe they do have bad motives. Maybe they'll grow. Maybe they'll mature. Maybe they'll do better. I don't know. But it's not just that. that it's like, eh, look at this. You know, look at this nonsense. It's also like, I don't really have much of an interest in it. It's like, why not just go listen to worldly hip hop if that's what's going on? You know, it's like, eh, eh. So I don't know who's sincere. And you know what else can happen? 
Uh, you can have people who were serious at the time, and then later, well, later on, they fall away. Case in point, Fanatic. Do I still listen to Cross Movement's movement and movement's music and still get amped when Fanatic's parts come on? Yes, I do. Because just uh, yesterday, I was playing some old DVDs uh, for the family, and uh, Fanatic came on of some Holy Culture album, When I Flow It's Gospel, and the single part that he had that they did a video for in the basketball court. Some of you know what I'm talking about, where Todd Bangs introduces it. I was still feeling it. I said, I'm still feeling what he's saying. You know? I, I was, I was, I was, and honestly, I think he was sincere at the time. Now it's a shame what's happened since then, right? Yeah, it is. It is a shame what's happened since then. I wonder if those lyrics are even available. I'm very curious now. Because, man, those lyrics used to get me amped. Nah, that's not the whole. Let's find out here. Let me let me, let me me just look here, a genius. Let's see. Do we got all of Holy Culture? Ooh. It's going down. What What, what was that song? Was it Rise Up? I just saw it. Hold on now. Hold on. I'm about to, I'm about to look. I, I want to know now. I want to know now, what was that song? Hold up, hold up, hold up. It's going down. Turn us up on that. Close to your driven rise up. It was the one where it's just the fanatic. And uh, it's going down. Forever crying no more. Start something. Oh, that's it. Yep. Start something. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm out to destroy this track. Your boy is back. Who would think gospel tactics would employ rap? Since I know heads will enjoy that, I rock it till the wheels fall off like a Benz or a Jag. See, even if I never get dough like whoa, it's cool just to know I never sold my soul. My goal was to get souls, not to go gold and get answers to shorties before she's dancing go go. And to talk to your boy before they call the po po, where he ends up in the morgue with the tag on his toe. See, if they could talk about cash or trash or they raps, then we could talk about. I'll snatch your cats out of traps that's set for your soul let's see it roll till we end up in our heavenly home who cares about how much or whether we blown it's not by it's not it's not man but by god that's best to be known <laughs> see that's fanatic and i think that's dope and i'm still down with that look at what he says here. he says some dope stuff i'm in the eye of the storm high above norm before the most high when i perform and not against the one watching one chair one stair hoping he's still there when i'm done watching if he's there then i hope that he's pleased with me this is not done easily i cook mics but the rhyme books i write chain since the father's aim wants to see jesus christ look alike so the more like the son the fanatic becomes that's less laps around the track that i have to run new character sprung old habits get hung now we're having some fun too bad because the now the track's done <laughs> oh see that, that's fanatic and now the dude's a hardcore atheist have you heard his stuff lately he has a whole show called ichabod you know instead of ichabod in the old testament it means in hebrew like the glory of the lord's departed Ichapod is in like podcast, you know, the Ica podcast. That's crazy, right? It's time to strike up the band, rise up and stand, and draw lines in the sand of time. We stand behind what we believe in following God, who squad re ready to die like Stephen, whether put to death or put to test, be for God, but to put it to rest. We'll be kicked, we'll leave an imprint like, a, like a, We'll leave an imprint like a foot in the chest with truth that'll shoot through your bulletproof vest. Watch out, he's venting. No, he's vintage, like age wine, a sage with rhyme sentence. But since man at his core is mad hard to reach, we know the Lord is using more than just parts of speech. Paragraphs paired up to smash, he'll bring the heat open up air ducts and shafts. Who can last in the smoldering heat when he throws a cold shoulder at his judgment seat, huh? The very breath that we breathe and every gift we receive is in the palm of his hand with no tricks up his sleeve. His and not a belief, so sit back in your seat, kick up, take your feet, and take it back to the streets. See, that's fanatic. Anyways, I know you wasn't asking all that soul of the earth, but here's what I'm saying. Turn to Philippians 1, read that, and then go there. That's what I believe we should do with, with when it comes to that, and I hope that helps. All right, that was a lot. Anyone coming into the smoke room? Uh, Chris brought the blood of Stephen to it. Shane Wire Finesse. Yeah, me too. I'm putting your comments on the screen. Yeah, I feel the same way, man. Oh, you need the link again? Okay, well, look, 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 look. I'm going to put it. Uh, here's what I'm going to do for everybody. 
I'm going to put the link on the screen again. But here's the thing, everybody. Here's the thing. Uh, it's it's the top link. It's pinned. So you should just be able to see it. Okay? But this is not a clickable link, so you have to, like, transcribe every word or whatever. But here, I'm putting it there. You see it down there below? That's a little unclear. So let me try to make it more clear. Okay? So there's the, the smoke room link. It's right below me right now on the screen. But let me take away this effect. And uh, let me see if you could see this better. And let me make it bigger. And then also let me change and give it a background. I think that will help. Can you see that now? It's right below me. That's the link. But listen, it's also... Oh, yeah, you can see it, but it's like... Okay, yeah, that works. Yeah, there we go. Okay, there you go. It's there. But listen, it's also in the live chat. Let me make sure, and I'll drop it in the live chat again, okay? This is the link. Oh, yeah. Oh, I didn't pin it, did I? That's my fault. I thought I pinned it, and I didn't. Okay, I have now pinned the message to the top of the screen. Maybe that's the problem what was going on. On Fire says, I love Christian hip-hop and rap, the sincere. All right, all right. Kyle and Meyer says, I'll answer that vocab. If I don't hear enough doctrine or relationship in their lyrics, I'm going to question how sincere they might be, just me. So I know what you're saying. So that is the kind of hip-hop, Christian hip-hop I prefer. However, sometimes I'm in different modes and in different moods. Sometimes I like a little different something-something when it comes to Christian hip-hop. And I can put on a little something different, different, you know? And I also think people who are at different places in their walks and in their style and preferences. And I think different types of Christian hip hop can benefit that in different ways and different times as well. And so I feel you on that, but I think that's what I think overall. We got JD here. Now, listen, I did not get to all your questions. So if I missed a question that you put up there in the, in, in the, in there, um, you're gonna have to ask it again with the, you know, the cue, and then you just put it in there, and I'll try to get to you. But okay, I think I've got your volume up, but I don't hear you. You're moving your camera around a lot. But let's try to see what you got to say, to... JD. There you go. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. How you doing, vocab? Oh, I'm doing great. Happy Sunday, my friend. Happy Sunday to you. Um. My question to you is I've been following the black Hebrew Israelites off and on because some of their doctrine gives me things to speak about on my channel. And the one that's been coming up a lot is Gabar's and Tahar's um, vision of Jesus being a separate entity. Um, and they don't believe in the Trinity. And the Bible is just so full of the fact that the, the spirit of God is the spirit of all three in, in different forms. And it, it's hard for me to understand how they jump off into that area. I was just wondering what your take on, on the Trinity and this, this Jesus is a separate entity from. Uh, I haven't heard this vision account. you're talking about. Now I know they're not Trinitarian JD, but I'm not sure. What, what do you mean? Um, what do you mean well, their vision? Are you saying they actually said they had they saw had some kind of vision of no, God or some? Well, they they're they're imagining it's a vain imagination to me is that um, Jesus Christ is a separate person than the than the Heavenly Father and the Holy Spirit. He's the Father and the Son are two different entities, is what they say. And from what I can tell from the scriptures, that's doesn't fit the story. Right. Well, it's rare, J.D., to find a heretic at all who's a Trinitarian. Almost all of our heretics, almost all anti-Trinitarian. Every now and then, don't get me wrong, you'll find some heretics who are Trinitarian, too. And so the Hebrew Israelites are no exception. And Tahar and Gabar will attack the Trinity. But whenever I've heard them, I've never heard them describe it correctly. Which is a real shame because you got to remember these guys have been doing this for, what, three decades of their life? Four decades maybe of their life? 
been talking to all these people, all this stuff. And the whole time, these poor guys still have not got a proper <laughs> understanding or definition of what the Trinity is. And yet they're vehemently opposed to it and against it. And trying to get them to define it accurately in the way a Christian believes it is pretty much impossible. So to me, that's bizarre. It's like I can disagree with a doctrine without misunderstanding it on purpose. So that's that's a problem one, is that obstinate, stubborn, lack of willing to learn or grow is a problem, first of all, because I've never even heard them describe the Trinity accurately in order to dismantle it. Now, you're right. If you mean to say that the Father and the Son are, when we say, are both not part of God, the Bible teaches us four things. There is one God, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Spirit is God. Four things in relationship to the person of, of God. Uh, the the right. being yeah. of God is probably even a better term. So they would deny that the Son is God in an unqualified sense, because you know there's a weird way in which they say the Son is God? They'll say as a, as a Hebrew, as a Hebrew male, he's God. They teach that. They'll teach that there's a deity that the Son possesses, but that basically they all would possess. But he's just has it earlier as a special created being of the father, kind of like Arians at that point. But yes, they are wrong. If they're saying, which they are, Jesus is not God in the same sense that the father is, because remember that was Arius. Arius was saying that the son is like the father in substance or essence, but he did not have the same essence or substance as the father. That was the, heresy that was dealt with at the Council of Nicaea. So here's the thing. The Father is not the Son. So if that's all they were saying, they'd be right about that. Trinitarians do not believe the Father is the Son. They are distinct persons. However, they are both God. So they are not each other, but both are part of the one being who is God. And so the one Westerners you're talking about, GMS, Tahar, and Gabar, they're wrong about the Trinity. They don't understand it, unfortunately. They basically think that we're saying that the Father is the Son. We're not saying the Son is the Father because they're distinct persons. That's why Jesus says, my Father. He couldn't say my Father if he was the Father. That's modalism. That's a different heresy. So here's the kind of straight and narrow path of Trinitarianism. You can fall off into Arianism, denying the deity of Jesus. You can fall off on the other side of the road into modalism, which is this being changes modes or forms into the Father, sometimes the Son, other times in the Spirit, other times. That's also a heresy. Also essentially dealt with it in Nicaea as well. Modalistic monarchianism is an or word for that. So they're incorrect. And the reason is, is many passages. Now, I'll stop there. I, I, I know you want to get in a word because you called in with a question. So that's just what I would say to your initial question. But go ahead, J.D. Okay, well, the modalism part for me, um, when he came here as the Savior, when he was born of the Virgin through the power of the, of the Godhead, of the Father, um, that's when he became an entity that was a man. And so the mode is man, God, um, example, um, someone to follow, someone to emulate, someone to teach us. But then when he says, I go back to my father and I have a place for you, I'm, I'm making a place for you there. Um, and he's sitting at the right hand. I see that as now he's back in Godhead mode and he left his spirit here, which is the same spirit of the father and the son to guide us back to the kingdom that's that's my interpretation is um, well would you say that different... you were it's, it, you might be a modalist yourself yeah and the in the mode has to do with is he in the body or is he no longer in the body so when he was in the body he was as a man god as man but then when he goes back to the father he actually goes back to the father and goes back to a spiritual bowl that anyone who is of the spirit is going to be in. We're all going to be of that same spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's the way um, I interpret it through um, Philippians 2, 5 through 9, where it's, he speaks of um, the name above all names. You know, it's, it's that holy name, that holy 
um, essence of the father that he actually is. I, I'm not going to be a, a robber. I don't claim to be the father, he says, or something like that. I'm not robbing, saying that I'm the same thing, but I am the same thing. My father and I are one. That's Those are the scriptures that I write on. I and my father are one. Right. So even in that scripture, though, notice he says, I and my father, right? Yeah. So he, he says that he doesn't he says say that he as a man. <laughs> he yeah, says that that's as a important, man. <laughs> but that's important, JD, because he doesn't say, I am the father. They are one in spirit. They are one in spirit. So he, right? it's, he says, I and my father. So he distinguishes himself from the father. Yeah, when he's here on earth, he he walks as the son of the father. Yes, but I, uh, I, you my, do you do you believe that the uh, the son is eternal? Yes. Well, so if the son's eternal, then how is it just when he walks on the earth that he's walking as the son? Which when it's not just when he's on earth, he's eternally the son. He is the word. He he created everything. He was the word was God and the word was God and the God God. Yeah, so was if he's eternally the son, then the father is eternally the father. It's very definitional to the very relationship that one's described as the father, one's described as the son. So they cannot be the same person. They have to be two distinct persons. They have to be. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think in the in the heavenly realm that the spirit is all in one and because it says somewhere in um i think it's corinthians and then at that point god will be all in all all in all in meaning all spirit will be within that godhead we're going to be in the temple we're going to be we're going to be part of the godhead we're going to be that light we're going to be that shiny brightness is that that's my interpretation is when, when we get the glorified body we will appear as he appears we will, okay, we well, that's sort of a different question as far as our uh, state or direction. Maybe we could tackle that another time. But in relationship to the Godhead, because if you're going to be talking to Hebrew Israelites and wanting them to believe a more biblical understanding of God, I would say you don't want to kind of convert them to modalism. A lot of Hebrew Israelites already are on the brink of some version of modalism. Some are closer to Arians. If you convert them to modalism, all you've done is converted them to a different heresy. You know, John 1.14 says, The Word was made flesh, dwelled among us, and we saw His glory, the glory that is of the only begotten Son of the Father, John 1.14. When you see that, you see that Jesus is the unique Son, but He's the Son of the Father. So I don't see how someone sees that and says, well, that's just temporary or that's just for a time being. Because if the word is eternal and the word in John 1, 1 is to be identified as the same one in John 1, 14, who's said to be the son, then he's always with the father, yet he's not the father. So by definition, he's not the same person. And so when, when Tahar and Gabar deny the son and the father are the same person, Trinitarians would agree with that. It's just denying that all partake in the shared existence of the being who is God. But do you believe that the Son and the Father could have a conversation with each other? Could they speak to one another as persons? Do you believe they could, J.D.? I don't know any place in the Bible where that happens. When Jesus says, prays, when Jesus prays, he prays to the Father. Yeah, right. Does the father, so does, who's he talking to then? He's talking to the one that sent him here to do the work. He's he's talking to the one whose will he must do as a man. And see, I I see us as little Jesuses. I we walk with his light in us, with his spirit in us. Where we abide with him. So when we go back to the spirit world, it's going to be the same thing. We're not going to be a separate entity anymore. We're going to be with him. We're going to be in him. He's in us. He abides in us. We abide in him and all will be all. That's, that's my interpretation is we, we have to follow Jesus in that way that we are full of the spirit, but we're still stuck here in these fleshy bodies and we have to deal with the temptation the things that christ 
the example that he set that I have to do my father's will. I have to love my brothers. I have to love him and understand him as spirit. I have to worship him in, in spirit and in truth and not in flesh and not in, not in separation. Is the way the way I interpret it. I don't know why. I don't know why that comes to me that way, but that's. Let me my see if I can, if I can yeah, show see. you uh, something here on the screen from John seventeen. So here we are in John seventeen, and uh, I'm going to try to get you back on the screen because right now it's just the verse and me. But that's take a look fine. at this. <laughs> take a look at this. When Jesus spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven. And said, Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that the Son yeah. may glorify you, since you have you have given him authority over all flesh, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and jesus christ whom you have sent so eternal life is defined as knowing the son and the father so this can't be but it talks the of the flesh person it speaks, it speaks of the flesh too he said well i mean you're at, you're adding that in there yeah we no, know jesus like, is in flesh but it doesn't say that you're adding this qualification but look at the verse no, John like he says he i glorified you on earth having go, go, accomplished go, the work that you go, go gave back up a little me more. Go back well, up a just, little bit. We just read that part, but okay. Yeah, it says flesh right there. See, you have given him authority over all flesh. Yeah, that's the that's what I see as we are flesh, and he's he the spirit has authority over us, and through him coming in the flesh, that's how we put off the old man and put on the new man. And so, okay, but that's a different question that has to do with sanctification and whatnot. Right now, we're just trying to find out if Jesus and the Father are to be understood as distinct persons, and I contend, along with you know Christians throughout history, that they, they are distinct persons. And so you're talking about our sanctification and oh. our end goal, but, but first we need to understand who God is. And so when I look at this, it says you got to know the Father and the Son. And look at this. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. Notice, He's saying, you gave me to do this. Again and again, you have the emphasis of there's the Father and there's the Son. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence. Now, this is key. With the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So before the world existed, Jesus is saying that he is in the presence of the Father and having that glory with him. But this would also show you, J.D., these are not to be understood as the same person, even if they partake of the same being. These aren't the same person here. You see that? Different person doing the same, telling the same story, completing the same story, the story yes. of redemption of the people. So, of course, the, the even father the and the Spirit. son are. Of course, the father and son are unified. And yeah, they're, that's uh, what I'm saying. And, there's a unified. There's a unification. Yeah, we're not going to disagree with that, brother. We we know that okay. they're unified in their goal, which is to bring redemption to a people, so that so that the Father can bring glory to His name. But that doesn't mean that they are the same. There's the Father. There's the Son. And verse five really, to me, is the nail in the coffin for any modalistic understanding. But look at what this is going to say. I manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Notice again and again, you're getting distinction of persons. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Notice it keeps on going back and forth. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have come to know in truth that I came from you. So you can't be sent by somebody if it's yourself. So we're not talking about the same person here. They have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All I mine think. are yours and yours are mine. And I am glorified in them. 
I mean, do you see this? Clearly, the son is not I, the father. I, I see. I see the I and the you and the you're the father. I'm the son idea. Right. But I guess in my spiritual understanding is the I and you and you and me is like the Holy Spirit being in me right now. It's in me. It's in me, but it's not me. But it is me because it's go it's the redemption. It's the redemptive power of the Father and the Son. So who is the Holy Spirit if if he's not a person? Third person of the Trinity. What 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 was he given? He was given to us. He, right? was, he was given, given to us. Yeah, he was given to us. So I say the he I, I feel like the he is the the same spirit that Christ came in um through the Heavenly Father. I don't I, I can see the personages were saying there is a son, there is a holy son, a god a son of God, a real divine being was born to a woman here and is walking as God. And that's I see him as God for some reason. I I don't Well that's a good him. thing. Jesus is God, J D. Yeah, yeah. And so I don't see him separate as it in a lot of ways because um he actually fulfilled himself by by sacrificing himself and coming in the flesh to make an example to us on how to how to walk, how to act. Yes, Jesus is our model of what perfect a perfectly pleasing life uh, given to God looks like. You're right about that, and that's why it's important that He was a man, and we don't deny His real manhood status. You know that He really was and really still is. But all I'm trying to, to get at is to understand that it's not the word separate. I think the word distinct is a better word, but we're just getting at the fact that the Father and the Son are distinct. Do you believe that the Father and the Son are the same person or that they're distinct persons? I think with, all, with the Lord, all things are possible. So he's both um, distinct to a man looking at the Bible and saying, okay, there can be, there were two different types. He came as a man, but he came from the father. He came from the original spirit. So yeah, I, I agree that they, he became another entity to a certain extent, but the entity he wait, became wait, wait. was- You're saying the father became the son? Yeah, that's how I look at it. He actually, so yeah, that is that is a modalistic- position you know and um you know you have it going far back in church history a guy named sibelius taught that god appeared in three distinct modes that he was the father in creation the son in redemption and the holy spirit of saint in sanctification and yeah, i tend to i tend to follow, follow that model yes yeah, so reason. that's that's sometimes called modalistic monarchianism or sibelianism is that, her heretical? <laughs> is that heretical? Is that heretical? Yeah, so it is heretical. So <laughs> let me show you let me show you uh, a few things that might be he helpful because you know we if we first of course want to say what is the what does the Bible say, right? That's most important. Um but it's also important to say okay, what have Christians before us said? And so here, let's take a look at the definition of modalism. Uh, within the Baker Encyclopedia <clears throat> of Christian Apologetics. Modalism is an unorthodox or heretical view of God that denies the orthodox Trinitarian view that there are three distinct co-eternal persons in the Godhead. See Trinity. Modalists claim that God simply manifests himself in different modes or forms at different times, which is basically the position you've just expressed but yeah. I'm hoping that you don't stay there. Modalists claim that God simply manifests himself in different modes or forms at different times. Unfortunately, some illustrations used by Trinitarians tend toward a modalistic concept of God. For example, modalists claim that God is like water, which can be manifested in one of three different modes at different times, liquid, gas, or solid, saying that that illustration is actually inaccurate in, re re in relation to who God actually is. Be better illustrations are more appropriate to Trinitarianism. They show that God is simultaneously a plurality within a unity, since he is three distinct persons in one eternal nature. So the key there is three distinct persons. That's the thing you're not agreeing with as of now, 
But that's a, that's the thing that's important because otherwise you don't have the son dying in the cross while the father uh, looks away in a manner of speaking. Because remember, Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That doesn't make sense on a modalistic rendering. It does make sense on a Trinitarian rendering, even though we wouldn't really hold that that uh, that um, that it's as if the, the Trinity was broken. That's not what we're saying by that. But it's a sense of what is going on in Psalm 22, and Jesus is claiming that. you got to read the whole psalm that he's quoting there, of course. But Trinitarianism can make sense of it. Three distinct persons in one eternal nature. So that's really the key right there of what Trinitarianism. God is like one triangle, his nature, which has three corner, his persons. In this illustration, the three and the one are simultaneous, not successive. Without three sides, there is no triangle. Further, each corner differs from the others, yet all share in the nature of a triangle. Or God is like one to the third power. One times one times one equals one. Here, too, there are three and one at the same time. It is not one manifests at three different times in three differing ways. In modalism, there is one person in the Godhead. In this sense, modalism is more like the traditional monotheism of Islam rather than Trinitarian theism. In the Trinity, three distinct persons unite in one eternal nature. Here's the last paragraph, then I'll let you respond, my friend. Both Trinitarianism and modalism are in contrast to tritheism, so this is something even worse yet, which affirms that there are three gods, one plus one plus one equals three, and we do not hold to that, neither of us. This is a form of polytheism. Like Trinitarianism, it has three different persons, but unlike Trinitarianism, it believes three separate beings are each a god with an individual nature. Orthodox Trinitarians hold that God has only one nature, but that three distinct persons co and co-equal share this same nature. So that's I think that's a helpful a helpful um, uh, dictionary entry. But yes, it does define your current position and correctly so as something that is unorthodox and heretical. But you don't have to stay there. <laughs> shout out to Desmond and Graham and shout out to Sunday Vibes. Those are two really good brothers. Go ahead, my friend. Okay, I like I like the point that you uh, pointed out that. On the cross, Jesus said, Father, why did you forsake me? Why have you forsaken me? And so that's that's definitely points to um, a relationship between two entities. There so you go. That, yeah, that cleared that cleared that that's got me thinking. So um, what well, I would say, okay, yeah, I'll let you get the last word. Have, then I'm gonna, try, I'm gonna move on. But uh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, yeah, I got I got to let you go. But that was but hey, that was good, both yeah, because. I don't. I don't want to be heretical. <laughs> I want to. I really don't. So, but now I know I'm a modalist to a certain extent, and maybe I can um, straighten that out somehow and um, render my belief system into a more coherent. Um, because I'm teaching, and I don't want to. I don't hmm. want to teach heretical stuff. So, well, maybe until you know some of that's sorted out, um, just uh, teach on some other stuff besides the nature of God. And I, and I say that, you know, as a friend, honestly. But check it out. There's some good people that I think on this that if you want to get more into this, because, you know, I do what I can, but I'm just a little guy over here on the Internet. And there's people that I think that are really good at this. And one of them is Eddie Dalcor. He, sometimes he'll go by Edward Dalcor, but it's E-D and then Edward or Eddie, D-A-L-C-O-U-R. He's really good at this and, and – uh, I think I've heard of that gentleman. I, I've, <clears throat> yeah, just look up, up on my, yeah any yeah. of his stuff on the Trinity. In fact, he has a book about about this that I think is so good, and I love hearing his lectures and his talks. He's so good, and just such a smart gentleman and a, a great friend. And uh, he's got an interesting story. You know, he used to be in the power team back in the day. I don't know if you know what the power team is, but back in the day, he was on the power team. He used to rip phone books up and stuff like that. And then another great guy on the Trinity is Tony Rogers or Anthony Rogers. And he has a great channel. Just put in Anthony Rogers Trinity, and you'll find some really fantastic stuff that he's got. And those are both guys. Uh, Anthony's more a live streamer, does YouTube videos. Ed, Ed uh, Dr. Dalcour is more of lectures and books. But they're both really good, and they're currently active, and they're two people that I would recommend, and I think you could benefit a lot from. And you know, a book that I think is good that's very easy to understand is 
The Forgotten Trinity by James White. If you read that, I think you'll appreciate that as well. And I think that'll help. James White, yeah, he's he's comes up in a lot of conversations. So yeah. So thanks a lot, uh, Vocab, for the time. I, I appreciate yeah. um talking yeah. to you and you you lead me peacefully into um possible new um realities about who Praise I, God. Who I hope is. so. And just so you know, you know, if I recommend somebody it doesn't mean I agree with everything they've ever said or done. I just tried to give a couple good resources for some areas that I think could be helpful to you that are uh, current and active and hopefully you benefit from that. If you want to go kind of, you know, higher, <laughs> higher level uh, than that, you know, and, and, and this is to anybody in the live chat as well, because, you know, people are watching this. Let me, let me look up my guy real quick here. He um, teaches at um, <clears throat> Talbot and uh, does some really great books named Fred Sanders. Fred Sanders has a book called the deep things of God the deep things of God. And man, it's a pretty amazing book. And he has many books on this and I recommend everything he does. Here's what the cover looks like. Uh, the deep things of God. It's got that little thing. here. I've seen that on the, I've seen that on the bookshelves and I, yeah, Fred yeah. Sanders, that's, that's kind of higher level. Uh, but I think it's a great book and, and that's something else that's fascinating, but let me know how it turns out and we'll get on to some other folks and you have a beautiful Sunday. Yeah. Right on YouTube. Bullcap. Thank you very much. God bless yes, you. sir. God bless. All right. See, guys, you know, we can have people that disagree and all that, and we, we don't have to act crazy with them or anything. And uh, the gentleman, you know, is searching, and I like the fact he's willing to be humble and open-minded about things. And so just pray for our, our, our brother J.D. I think, uh, I think he'll come along, and I'm, and I'm uh, excited to see what happens uh, in his walk next, you know. And uh, we can all benefit from this and, and grow from this. So, you know, he's he's one guy, but we all can listen in in the conversation, hopefully, and grow. And I love talking about those things. And so, that's a that's a good thing. And so, uh, just just pray for that brother on his journey, because we all need prayer and grace as we go along in these things. So that was the first caller. We've gotten a lot of questions in the live chat, and I'll take some more here. Um, but you know. Uh, it's always great to have uh, people actually call in. Shout out to Jay Wills for the super chat. You deserve an applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, man, for the super chat. Um, it really helps everything go uh, how it needs to go. And Nate, thank you for bringing up that book. And that's a good book. Sunday Vibes, who makes great lo-fi music. Everyone, go type in Sunday Vibes on Apple Music if you use that. Pandora, if you use that, Spotify, if you use that, Amazon Music, if you use that. I don't know. Do you have stuff on YouTube, my man? But he does some really dope lo-fi stuff, Sunday Vibes. Great guy. You know, he's like a humble guy, but he's like a celebrity in here. For real. He's a real artist. He says, it's key to understand three one does not mean three parts that make up one God. Yes, exactly right. You are correct, and I appreciate that contribution as well as Dinu. Dropped a link from, a, I think it was a lecture I did or a live stream. I'm not sure now. But yes, Trinity is biblical. Here's why. That's a good talk, I believe. And uh, Sunday Vibes got another uh, option to try to understand the Trinity. And uh, thank you very much for that. Yeah, you know, he said that, but I think he got out of that. HBMD with a comment. Thank you for that as well. Oh, we got Radar Apologetics in the house. Everyone definitely subscribe to my man. He's one of the best in the business. Best in the business. And I pray that he comes along and jumps on the show sometime again. I know he's a busy guy. But yo, when are you going to be putting out that video about the Jehovah's Witnesses in the Watchtower from San Diego? I've been waiting forever. Where's my shout out? Just kidding, man. Yeah, yeah, I hope that you uh, drop those quick, man, because I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I've got a lot of a lot of different comments here. I'm just putting some of your comments, uh, you know, regarding the Trinity and whatnot. So I appreciate everybody. And uh, thank you, D-New, with another, man, you were dropping all the, the flashback links that people need to hear. And Sunday Vibes asks a good question, an important question that I think is relevant to the discussion we just had. And that's a good question. Everyone look on the screen and see that question. Whose voice did people hear from the heavens at Jesus' baptism? Thank you very much. And um, 
Shout out also to John McDermott. And shout out to On Fire for Jesus Apologetic. Hector says, the U.S. government is admitting to having in its possession unhuman biological beings. What do you think this is? So, Hector, I have not heard that the U.S. government admits to having biological beings that are not human in their possession. Am I out of the loop on this? So, I can't answer until I have more information because I need more information because I don't know if that's the case. Um, I guess, well, in a certain sense, right, isn't a dog, and I'm not trying to be funny because I know this isn't what you're talking about, but, you know, isn't a dog a biological being that's not human? You know, a dog would be. But I, I know that's not what you mean because you followed up with saying, could it be Nephilim? So Christians have different discussions on Nephilim from Genesis 6 and things like that. I usually um, don't get too involved with those because I usually have a, a position that people don't like. It's not as romantic or sensational. Um, I do not think that there are hybrid beings that are part human and part fallen angel or demon or Elohim or anything like that that have ever, ever existed, will ever exist, or could ever exist. So when people define the Nephilim that way, I don't think that that exists. I don't think there's good evidence or reason to think that. Do you know some other links in relationship to this, which I appreciate? And that was good. And around the world in 80 days asking questions, does JD think he can be a son in the same way Jesus was? That's a good question, and, and I appreciate that, no doubt. And you are right on fire. Man, somehow Dinu found all the links. Let me keep on dropping these about the conversation we just had. Quite a few. And I'm still putting your guys' comments on the screen here because you guys were saying a whole lot of things, and I appreciate that. And uh, we had some fun. Uh, it looks like you guys were having some fun there in the live chat. Dinu with the Trinity debate. We have a Sakari as well. Wow, 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 wow. So question, um, has the audio broken up at all? Has it broken up at all? Because we eliminated the Facebook, which I didn't really want to do, but we did eliminate it. And the theory was that maybe that will work. Maybe that will work. Kayim says, what touched my heart about you is the Holy Spirit. And I see your intentions are really good. You're not just about campaigns against PHI. Well, thank you. I do appreciate that. And that that is true. That's a specialization because I believe in specializations. But ultimately, I love Jesus. You know, my driving thing before I met a Hebrew Israelite was the Lord. And, you know, when I'm dead and gone, I'm going to be up there and, and I'm going to be with the Lord by God's grace. And I'm going to be worshiping him. I'm not going to be thinking about Hebrew Israelites. I'm going to be thinking how good he is, how powerful, how amazing, how awesome he is how much of a gracious God we have and how much of a sinner I was, but how good he is and how strong and powerful and beautiful his mercy is, you know? No joke. Luncho says, thank you for answering my question, Malone. May the Most High Jesus Christ bless your life, ministry. Always looking forward to your debates, brother. Thank you. Lou says, when are you going to interview Garfield? Interesting. You know, back in the day, Garfield did interview me. And it mainly consisted of him trying to trip me up on Old Testament gotcha questions. I guess I did okay. Some people said I did. I need to take that and put it on my channel. It's on one of his old channels. And so I haven't put it up on my channel. It's old at this point. Garfield and I are provisionally friends, you know, in a certain manner speaking. Uh, obviously different things. So, hey, hey, hey. But he's an interesting guy, smart guy, and I appreciate some of the work he does. But ultimately, he is an unbeliever. But uh, we could have an interesting conversation, couldn't we? I agree. Kaim says, I need to read In Route to Global Occupation. All right, well, uh, I'm not opposed to that. Just got to see what's what's up with that. So just let me know what's going on there. Uh, da, da, da. 
Kime says Calvin and Luther stood fiercely against each other's beliefs. They asked John Calvin, where does he think Luther went at since he died? He said he believed Luther was as close to the bosom of the father as one can be. They, I could totally see him saying that. I think Cal, Calvin was pretty gracious despite some of his bad reputation, and I could totally see that. Kaim says, Somebody's a God and UPC split based on baptism in Jesus' name or Father, Son, and Spirit. That was the st stupidest. Well, so not going to agree with you there because I don't think it was a stupid split because it was more than just about the baptism formula. It was about what's actually going on in the nature of God. And so that's that's the thing, and I think you know Jim Jimmy Berman makes a comment on that as well. You know, okay, so let's go down here and uh, see what new questions we have as well. On fire says my second time popping in. Really liked how you went through. Well, sorry, it's not working. Well, I appreciate that, John, as well. Let's see here. There was some audio break in the beginning, but haven't heard it since. Okay. Well, okay, Nate. Thank you. Appreciate that. Huh. Interesting. And why do Trinitarians think that refers, Hebrews 1, 10 through 12, refers to the Son as the Creator? Uh, I'm not sure exactly what you're saying. Could you... Could you maybe reword that or rephrase that a little bit? I'm I'm turning to it right now, but I'm trying to understand exactly what your question was. I think I might understand what you're saying, but let's read Hebrews 1 and see what it says here, okay? Hebrews 1, verse 10 says this. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth. The heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. So you're saying, why do Trinitarians think that that's the sun? Is that what you're saying there? Um, a few things there. First of all, um, the reason why these texts get connected, because then the basis of this common key word or concept the concept that you see in verse 8 is the throne lasting forever and ever. And that's where you get the Psalm 102, 25 to 27 connection because it says there that God's faithfulness in years will never end. Well, what's going on there in Hebrews 1? It's describing God's final word, his son, you know, before what does verse 1 say? In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. So, I mean, they're just connecting the whole chapter together. You're saying, why do Trinitarians think that it refers to the Son as the Creator? Well, let's just connect this whole pericope together. My friend, look what it says here, EEW. It says that he has spoken to us by his son. And now it talks a little bit about who this son is. He's appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. So the son made the universe. I mean, so how is he not the creator? The son is the radiance of God's glory. So this relates actually to our further our question we had earlier with JD. The son is not the father. But that's not to say that the Son is not God. Of course, the Son is God. Otherwise, you could never say the Son is the radiance of God's glory. It wouldn't make sense. And neither would the next line. And the exact representation of his being. Exact representation? Ah, oh, you know? Sustaining all things by his powerful word. So if the Son sustain, sustains all creation, it makes sense to understand him as being the creator, especially when the verse prior says that he's how all things were made. After he had provided purification for sin, so it's clear still talking about the Son, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Now, this whole next section speaks about how the Son is superior to the angels. So it's really a natural thing to understand that it's saying that the Son's a creator there. I'm not, I might be missing something about your question, and if I am, uh, forgive me. 
But that's all I really could say that there for now for EEW. Steamy Mimi's says first Corinthians 8 6 speaks of the fathers and the son's active role in creation and sustaining creation. You know, I love you guys. How you guys bring the scriptures. You guys bring in those scriptures. You guys know what's up with the Bible, and you guys got something to add. And in fact, Jay Wills says verse 8. So he says, well, let's make sure that we read 1 Corinthians 1, 8, and that'll tie it all together. So let's continue on where I left off at verse 5. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son, saying that the son is distinct and different and superior to any angel because none of the angels are God's son, the son of God, in the way that the son alone is. Verse 6. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, so notice again, it's a distinction there. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So the son is explicitly called, O God, here in verse 8. A scepter of justice will be on the scepter of your kingdom. You have love, righteousness, and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. Isn't that good? That's good. And there it's important to understand when it says firstborn in verse 6. This has to do with inheritance rights of the oldest son. Actually, according to Deuteronomy 21.17, this same thing, firstborn, is the title of the Davidic king of Psalm 89, 26-27. And look what it says, let all God's angels worship him. This is the coronation of Jesus as king and shows consequently that he is superior to the angels. The author of Hebrews applies a text from the Septuagint rendering of Deuteronomy 32:43 and uh, a context that the the Jews of that time would use to worship uh, uh, used for worship, I'm sorry, right? I'm sorry, alongside with the Psalms. And so these words also appear in some of these early Hebrew manuscripts as well. So he's tying it all together in a very naturally Hebraic way is the point by saying that. I apologize says, why do Trinitarians arbitrarily see Cod and Deuteronomy 6.4 as a complex unity when all references in the grammar are singular? Help me understand what you mean by that as well. Oh, shout out to DMG Poet. DMG Poet. Man, can I get you on the show? I have got to get you on the show. You've got an amazing story, and I would love to hear your story on this program sometime. Let me know what you think of that. Let's link up. Hold on. Let's try to get back to these, these questions here. We got... Uh, <clears throat> EEW says, well, Hebrews 1.3 is from Wisdom uh, 7.26, so its creative role will be like Wisdom of Proverbs 8.22, 20, 20, instrumental, not the creator. Well, so notice how you're leaving the text saying Hebrews 1.3 is from an apocryphal text, and then we're going to Proverbs 8, but I always have a problem when people essentially equate Jesus with Wisdom and Proverbs 8 for a few reasons. Uh, first of all, Proverbs there is described in a feminine way, and that can't be in any explicitly ontological way to be understood to be Jesus, because it's not described masculine, but described feminine. And so I know the Jehovah's Witnesses do that a lot, but I don't know about that because it's feminine there. You know what I'm talking about? And why are you saying that it's from the Apocrypha, and even if it was, how does that offset the meaning that the author of Hebrews is putting together directly there in the text? Problematic, I would say. Steamy Mimi's, thank you very much for the comments, and I encourage people to check that out as well. DMG says he's down to come through, and he's going to hit me up. Good, I appreciate that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Let's do that. Okay. Um, da, 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 da. Thank you for all your comments there. And we have a follow-up here from my apologist. He says, 
Bocap, have you heard of the grammar disagreement with Hebrews 1, that the vocative isn't the only option, the nominative is better, your throne is God? Well, let me take a look in the Greek, and I'll tell you what I think about that. Um, I don't think we get to say what we, I don't know, want it to be. But hold on, let me see here. Continuing with your comment from earlier, this is my second time popping in. Really have to say the way you explained Trinity was in a very understandable and simplified way. Props to that. The first time I accidentally got sent before not. I understand that. Uh, okay. So let's see here. We're going to have to go to the uh, the text and see here what you're saying. Let me look at a couple more of your questions, and we'll have to pick this up some other time because uh, we're going on two hours, my man. And that's not your fault. I'm just saying. You're saying uh, the Trinitarian scholars claim that "Oh God" is in the vocative for. for uh, what do you mean by a vocative for a nominative? Because I just see nominative. I don't see anything about vocative. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm missing something here. I'm missing some kind of information or some kind of understanding. So that's that's not your fault if you're accurately saying what it is. The nominative actually refutes your position, vocab, but it is in the nominative. I don't see vocative on here. So. But let's just say that's the case. Um, if he's saying your throne is God, that that's not anti-Trinitarian. Let's just say it's saying your throne is God. And again, you got to help me understand your argument better here because this is one text. Um, the son's deity, Trinitarianism, is not relying upon the uh, author of Hebrews' uh, divine, I would say, interpretation of Psalm 45, right? That's not really so fundamental to it and this doesn't do away with it this would be saying something different than what you're saying trinitarian say it is but i don't even know it's really such a trinitarian issue in that way so something is i'm missing something here so i'm trying to be humble about it here you know because um something is is not computing on my end and like i said i'll take the blame here i'm trying to follow you um but uh so far, I'm, I'm not quite understanding what this does. Like, what work does this do for a position you're saying I should have? But you were just reading the text. Yeah, I'm just reading the text. That's right. I mean, but I just, I parsed it out using Lagos and went through and I didn't see uh, where you're saying people are saying evocative is. Because you don't, we don't get to... Uh, say when we parse out a greek word we don't we don't get to tell it what it is so i wonder are you talking about a textual variant or something i'm just trying to understand here you're just reading text you're correct i don't believe there's evocative semantic there thank you vocab that is my point if the nominative is the correct position then it can be correctly translated as your throne is god the throne will be a subject not god again let's just say that was the case how does that destroy trinitarianism because you said it refutes my position don't I don't follow that. Oh, so you guys are checking out the debate right now. Well, let me get out of here so we can watch this debate.